My name is Father Stefanos Alexopoulos. I am Associate Professor of Liturgical Studies at Sacramento Theology here at the School of Theology and Religious Studies and the Director of the Institute for the Study of Eastern Christianity. I'm greatly honored to introduce Father Peter Galaza tonight, the Basil H. Lawson Visiting Professor and Chair of Ukrainian Church Studies at the Catholic University of America. Father Peter joined us in January, coming from the Shafritsky Institute, where he held the Kuhl Family Professor of Liturgy Chair and was the director of the aforementioned institute. Father Peter is no stranger in Byzantine and liturgical studies. Known for his passionate teaching, deep faith, solid scholarship, and endless energy, <laughs> Father Peter is both an accomplished scholar and a sensible pastor, a wonderful combination of what we are called to be, academics in service to Christ and his church. Father Peter's CV is impressively extensive. His numerous publications demonstrate a scholar with many strengths, deep knowledge, wide range of interests, and a commitment to interdisciplinary work. In each of these areas, his work is indispensable. For example, one cannot study the liturgical tradition of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, the Slavonic liturgical tradition, translations of Byzantine liturgical texts, liturgical translation of the Septuagint, funeral rites in the Byzantine liturgical tradition, or liturgical theology without diving into and making references to, follow, to the work of Father Peter. He has served the academy in many different ways, and I will highlight only two. First, by being the editor of the Logos, a journal of Eastern Christian studies, and by serving as vice president, president, and past president of the Society of Oriental Liturgy. It is in this latter capacity that I had the honor of serving him as secretary. And that is where I got to know Father Peter as a human being. Kind, polite, loving, patient, faithful, ecumenical, passionate, and with endless amounts of energy. <laughs> a child of the martyric Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, Father, Pre Father Peter is an archpriest of the Viv, Viv Archeparchy and was awarded a jeweled pectoral cross for his services as acting dean of the Lviv Theological Academy in the early post-Soviet years. The institution that since then has become the Ukrainian Catholic University. Father Peter has continuously worked and continues to do so in service of his church, contributing to its resurrection and blossoming in the post-Soviet times. As Ukraine today suffers from Russian incursion and war, Father Peter will address us today with a fascinating lecture that promises de to demonstrate how and what we can learn from history. His lecture is titled, Liturgy in the Underground Church of Ukraine, 1946 to 1989, and Lessons for Today. Please join me, join me in welcoming Father Peter Galatz. Thank you so much. That gift was a good investment. <laughs> good evening, and as we say uh, in Ukraine, Slava Isusu Christu. As we say in English-speaking countries, glory to Jesus Christ. Glory I want to thank Father Stephanos for such a very uh, laudatory uh, akathist, or akathistist hymn on, on my behalf. Uh, and I want to thank um, you for making me feel so much at home with this weather today. You know, this is just so, so Canadian. Thank you, you know. I came down here hoping to get, get some warmth. But I certainly have experienced a lot of warmth from the, the wonderful people that I meet here every day. So as Father Stephanos mentioned, although curiously enough, he, um, because of some oversight, no doubt, forgot to mention 
the words that come before the colon. Uh, my, my talk this evening is entitled, The Power of the Powerless, Liturgy in the Underground Church of Ukraine, 1946-1989, and some lessons for today. The desire for power, the lust for power, has always been among the most destructive of human passions. The saving action of Jesus Christ confronts this passion head on. Christ's crucifixion and resurrection were a direct answer to the questions, who rules the world and to what end? On Golgotha, an imperial power tortures and kills Jesus to demonstrate that its authority is supreme. Jesus does not run from the challenge. In fact, he willingly accepts it in spite of the bloody sweat that proves his awareness of just how frightening the torture will be. He is killed, but imperial impotence is exposed when the crucified one rises from the tomb. My lecture this evening will describe and analyze how a group of 20th century Eastern Catholics enfleshed this victory on a regular basis. They thus revealed how the tyranny of corrupted power can be resisted in the depth of one's being and having been vanquished there can go on to challenge entire legions of liars, haters, and killers, all without lying, hating, or murdering. I will begin my lecture with an explanation of how the underground liturgical experience of the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church reflects some of the earliest theology of worship codified in parts of the New Testament. I will then turn to a description of illustrative liturgical practices during this period of persecution and note that from 1946 to 1989, the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church was the single largest outlawed Christian community in the world. Finally, my lecture will draw out some lessons for today. Thus, after briefly engaging modernity's masters of suspicion, that is, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, I will suggest how these lessons can help us navigate the shoals of post-modernity and also provide inspiration for Ukrainian Catholics today, as well as a lesson on true orthodoxy for the Russian Orthodox Church of the Moscow Patriarchate. Before I begin, I should point out that somewhat curiously, imprisoned worship, as it has been dubbed by a Ukrainian researcher in the field, has not received the, intention, uh, the attention it deserves from liturgical scholars. Moreover, though less surprisingly, histories of the Soviet gulag and similar iterations of barbarity, such as Nazi concentration camps, have also virtually ignored this strategy of survival. In other words, worship in camps, in prisons, etc. Anne Applebaum's outstandingly magisterial book, The Gulag, contains only five references to any kind of underground worship, and none of them pertains to the Ukrainian church. But this will change. The extensive and solidly researched studies of Father Ivan Hovera, a Greco-Catholic priest who began seminary in the underground in 1980 and was ordained in 1990, will hopefully generate greater interest in this form of subversive sacramentality, or maybe sacramental subversion. Now that Ukraine has finally gained the attention it always deserved, such resistance is bound to attract attention. Three years ago, the fruits of Father Ivan Hovada's doctoral research at the Pontifical Oriental Institute in Rome were published in book form. I'm indebted to him and other studies by him for many of the details of underground worship to be mentioned this evening. Moreover, a very moving account of women's religious practices is recounted by Oksana Kiss in a book recently translated into English entitled Survival as Victory, Ukrainian Women in the Gulag. 
This evening, however, we are particularly honored to have with us the founder of the Institute of Church History at the Ukrainian Catholic University in Lviv and its president, Archbishop Boris Gudziak of Philadelphia. Father Hovada, the researcher that I just mentioned, notes in, in several of his studies that without the thousands of oral histories compiled by Archbishop Gudziak's institute, his own, in other words, Hovada's work would have been impossible. And thus, when I learned that the Archbishop will be in the area this week, I immediately asked him if he would be willing to provide additional comments on tonight's topic. He graciously agreed, and this will be a unique treat for all of us. And I'm really hoping that I can do my lecture in the space of about 40 minutes and give even a full 20 minutes, if not more, to, to Archbishop Guzak. In fact, I will not be offended if all of the dialogue after that is between him and you, because not only does he have a vast knowledge of, of this topic, but he has been to Ukraine, what, four or five times since February 24th? Four or five. You probably don't even remember because it's five now, okay. So, uh, you know, the Archbishop has been doing an amazing amount of, of work in Ukraine and also in other um, parts of the world, like the Vatican, trying to um, get the, the story about um, the, the suffering in Ukraine right. Owing to the different levels of knowledge regarding the Ukrainian Greco-Catholic Church and its modern history, not to mention the history of the Gulag, I've prepared a one-page reference sheet that you can consult as I deliver my lecture tonight. So all of you have received this, and you will probably from time to time, when I mention whether it's Brezhnev or, uh, I don't know, um, Stalin's death, uh, et, et, et cetera, uh, those may not be um, facts that immediately um, bring to mind particular information, but that's why I've got this, uh, this little reference sheet for you. And by the way, not only does it list the various phases of the persecution of the underground Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church and, and churches in general, but it also gives a list of the different kinds of locales, venues, places, sites where worship took place because there's a big difference whether the worship that I'm describing is taking place in a prison cell on the one hand or in somebody's uh, apartment in downtown Lviv or for that matter in an open field uh, in one of the forests uh, outside Lviv. So make sure that you, uh, when, you're, when you're thinking about what I'm uh, discussing this evening, you keep in mind these different venues and this, this uh, rather different chronology, a difficult chronology, sorry. I should also note that uh, my lecture tonight is not just about filling a lacuna in liturgical research, as crucial as that may be. It is also about sharing testimony regarding stirring encounters with some of the most beautiful individuals I have ever met. One of the greatest blessings of my life was the opportunity to meet some of these underground clergy and laity just six months after the Greek Catholic Church of Ukraine had been decriminalized. It was June 1990 and the Soviet Communist Party was still in power. But public religious instruction was no longer illegal and thus I was able to teach a liturgy course in the view and thus privileged to observe these confessors of the faith praying, teaching, and yes, laughing. The encounters with these modern day saints will feed my soul until the day I die. Allow me then to begin with a memory of one such confessor of the faith. This will lead to an unpacking of the New Testament theology that I mentioned above. The memory is actually of a virtual event, but it prepared me for the real thing. It derives from a video I saw six months before I was actually able to meet the subject of the tape. So in 1989, when you will recall, the USSR still existed, and the KGB was, if severely weak and still a force that one might have to reckon with, a visitor from Canada made a video of Metropolitan Volodymyr Sternyuk of Review celebrating liturgy in his one-room Soviet apartment. 
The small space served as his office, his bedroom, his living room, and his cathedral. All of a sudden, during the divine liturgy, one hears the doorbell ring. And all of a sudden, one notices a faint stir among the handful of worshipers. Experience had taught them that this could be a raid. It turned out not to be one, but I adduced the example for the following reason. Watching that video, I became overwhelmed by the sensation that for the first time in my life, I was seeing a real divine liturgy. Doctrinally and historically, of course, this is absurd. It was hardly my first time. And yet the sensation wouldn't leave me, and I began to realize why. It was because until that point in my life, I had never seen a liturgy for which one could be arrested. I had never seen liturgy and real life conjoined so completely. As Archbishop Sternuk raised the gifts, the holy gifts, saying, yours of your own, we offer to you in behalf of all and for all. He could have been interrupted by someone requiring him to place not a piece of bread, but possibly his very life, and certainly at that point, at least his comfort on the pattern, the, the discourse of oblation. Certainly many of his colleagues had done so throughout the decades. Now Romans 12, 1 reads, I appeal to you by the mercies of God to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your rational worship. Many of you will be familiar with the more common translation, spiritual worship or possibly reasonable worship. The Greek original is logiki latria or logike latreia, as in like logical and then idolatry, for example, and thus rational worship is certainly my preferred translation, the translation used by the Ukrainian Catholic Church in English. The phrase is crucial for any theology of worship. St. Paul is arguing that worship must engage the believer's totality that goes far beyond the four walls of the church. And when one does this, one is offering a worship in keeping with God's mind. Offering the extrinsic will not do. One's whole being, one's very body, must be summoned and rallied for committed adoration. And incidentally, the theology of Logiki Latri is particularly important for those of us who practice the Byzantine tradition because the Byzantine tradition invokes this term, rational worship, Slovasnaya Služba, as a definition of what actually transpires in church. At almost every Eucharist, during the heart of the Chrysostom and Aphra, the presider twice proclaims, we offer you this rational worship. And the term comes up in Basil's and Aphra and in the Liturgy of the Hours. Now let me then turn to a description and at least superficial analysis of actual liturgical practice in the underground Greco-Catholic Church. In other words, concrete examples of logiki latria, logike latreia. I'll have to limit myself, limit myself to four sacraments and two other liturgical rites. And please note, incidentally, that in authentic Eastern Christian theology, sacraments and liturgy are not distinguished in the way that they came to be in Latin scholasticism. In any case, the services I will reflect on are baptism, the Eucharist, marriage, and orders, and I will then offer some remarks about the liturgy, the hours, and funerals. One of the paradoxical things about the celebration of baptisms in the underground, if one can indeed use the word celebration, is that being a church not recognized by the Soviet government was in at least one way advantageous. So people would sometimes seek the ministry of an underground priest, or for that matter, a laywoman or clandestine nun, more on that below, 
rather than a priest of the Moscow Patriarchate because there was no danger that the baptism would be recorded in a register that could be inspected by the government. However, in the case of the above ground, that is Orthodox Church, the hierarchs of the Patriarchate of Moscow insisted that its clergy keep such records. Anyone seeking baptism in the official church had to decide whether they could trust the priest to hopefully either alter the name of the baptismal party or forego recording the baptism altogether. Consequently, whenever the faithful had doubts about the priest, and, and on the other hand knew of a bona fide and respected underground priest, they might arrange for him to come in the middle of the night, sometimes with the barest minimum of people present, in order to perform the baptism. Of course, in this case, the risk was that the priest and those invited, those who invited him, could be arrested or at least fined, and in any case, publicly shamed. Apparently, however, people were willing to take a risk which they could control rather than having to wonder whether the state registered priest might end up recording the baptism after all. And even more importantly, there is, of course, the fact that some preferred to avoid the priests of the Moscow Patriarchate out of very legitimate ecclesiological motives or because such priests lacked the stature or integrity of underground priests. In any case, there was a segment of society which, because of their position of authority, was particularly concerned to control the risks. A stark example concerns the baptism in the family of a KGB employee. The story goes as follows. In downtown Lviv, western Ukraine, during the 1980s, Father Mikhailo Shemchishin, an underground redemptorist, was approached in his apartment at night by a local police officer told to prepare whatever he needed to perform a baptism and to wait at a nearby taxi stand. Father Shevchishin didn't know whether he should treat this seriously or as a provocation, but figured that he had no choice anyway. I mean, the, the police already knew where he was and you know, what he was about. At the designated time, he appeared at the taxi stand where a driver picked him up and drove him to a location that turned out to be next door to the regional offices of the KGB. Fortunately, he was not ushered into the offices, but rather to a building across the street where employees of the KGB lived. On the second floor, he was led into an apartment where two families had gathered. The curtains were drawn, and the only lighting in the apartment was the flickering of two candles placed on the floor. The head of the household, who, by the way, greeted the priest with the word Slava Isusu Christu, then told him that they had a one-year-old son whom they wanted baptized and that they also wanted to be married. Father Shevchishin then proceeded to hear the confession of those present, serve the Eucharistic liturgy, baptize the child, and perform the marriage. The child, uh, incidentally, and very fortunately, remained quiet throughout the long services. Having celebrated these sacraments, the priest was politely led outside where a different car drove him back home. Among the interesting aspects of this description is that, especially in the case of weddings in downtown or village settings, underground priests, in spite of the risks, generally insisted on confession and communion, as we saw in this case. And they also usually insisted on some form of marriage preparation. I was pleasantly surprised to learn that in the underground during certain periods, very often such marriage preparation did take place in some form in spite of how dangerous every meeting with an underground priest could be. Presumably, however, in the case of the marriage solemnized and just referenced to the 
marriage solemnized by Father Shovchish, and the priest did not insist on a pre-Kena session because of the far higher risk and be, maybe because the couple had been civilly married for some time. An example of another baptism in the home of a government official is provided by Sister Maria Lacher. The nun, born into a Jewish family, but so impressed by the Ukrainian Studite sisters who sheltered her during the Holocaust that she requested baptism and joined the religious order as an underground monastic. In other words, she was so impressed, sorry, I um, end of sentence. She joined uh, as an underground monastic. And after the war, the above ground Sister Maria held a clerical job in the school system of a provincial town. What you need to understand is that uh, if you were an underground anything, you still obviously had to have an above ground job. Uh, otherwise, you would, of course, been arrested for parasitism, and as for being a parasite on society. So her job uh, during an earlier period, uh, right after the war, was as a, um, a cleric in the um, the school system of the, the provincial town, Penemishlane. The following example illustrates the difference between the 1980s, when Father Shochishin baptized the one-year-old boy, and the more brutal 1950s, when Sister Maria was called upon to do the following. One day, the director of the regional school system, who, of course, could not have held his position without being a member of the Communist Party, approached Sister Maria and asked her to come to his house and baptize his child. She agreed, and at night was led to the baby's crib, where the parents stood on either side, one of them holding a candle, while she baptized the child, limiting the rite of course to the minimal formulas, the servant of God, the name is baptized, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. The parents then crossed themselves, prayed for a moment, and Sister Maria left. In the 1950s, especially in a town where everyone knew who was who, an adult male not known to locals, such as an underground priest, walking the street and entering a prominent person's home, especially at night, would raise suspicion. Thus, women, both lay and religious, were frequently asked to perform baptisms during this period. This illustrates the vital role played by women in either celebrating religious services or facilitating them. So I want to show you some slides of some of the kinds of women who would have been called upon to do that kind of ministry. So here you have a photo of underground nuns obviously taken after Stalin's death. They would have never tried something like this before 1953. Very often, uh, nuns, in the same way that uh, Sister Maria Lacher was a clerk, and then she later um, worked in a hospital, uh, clandestine nuns would work in, in hospitals as nurses, and they were, of course, the most respected nurses. And they, by the way, in the hospitals, were frequently called upon to either do baptisms or to notify a priest that someone uh, who was dying or very ill wanted to see a priest. And so they would try to find a way to, to do that, but there were times when uh, the, the nun, the clandestine nun, would be the one to bring communion to the person who was dying in the hospital. Uh, this is a picture of a downtown Lviv convent chapel, and I don't know, yeah, you can see it there. There's, there's a wall clock, uh, obviously on the wall, and it's a tabernacle. And this is a typical container, uh, the kind of container that could be repurposed as a Eucharistic pyx, or sometimes they would also, uh, in uh, a little vessel like this, carry communion bread that was going to be consecrated. Now, before turning 
uh, to Eucharistic practice, Eucharistic practice as opposed to baptismal practice, allow me then to cite just one dramatic instance of the kind of assistance that I just mentioned, the assistance of women in facilitating uh, the celebration of these sacraments or access to the sacraments. The uh, instance is dramatic, not only because of the fate of the person involved, but also because it took pla place as late as 1982 in the middle of a large urban center. A 20-year-old laywoman named M Maria Schweda, who worked in a factory as a coil adjuster. I had to look up uh, what the term Pidhonstitsya Kotushok is, and the translator says that that's a coil adjuster. Uh, having found the translation from the Ukrainian, I'm still not sure what she did, but in any case, she worked in a factory. Okay. So this woman, Maria Shveda, would frequently assist priests who were traveling from one home to another or from one town to another on their way to celebrate a rite or bring communion. In fact, as I just mentioned, sometimes it was precisely the, the lay woman or nun who brought communion. And because the liturgical items could easily be confiscated by agents sent to follow the priest, women walking at a safe distance from the priest would carry the items. On September 29, 1982, on a Lviv park bench, Ms. Shveda met Father Peter Perizhok, an underground priest, with the purpose of obtaining a pouch with the sacramental liturgical items. Immediately, two plain-clothed uh, agents approached Ms. Shveda and attempted to rip the pouch from her hands. She began running, and the agents chased her down a city street and into the entrance of an apartment complex. A scuffle ensued, and Shveda's screaming was heard by several witnesses as the agents beat her head with brass knuckles, causing her to fall and die within 30 minutes of the ambulance arriving to transport her to the hospital. The witnesses reported that not only did blood surround her head as she lay on the ground, but streaks of blood from her fingers could be seen on the wall of the driveway, or rather of the entrance, excuse me, which means that she was trying to stand while the beatings were taking place. The items that uh, she was carrying in the pouch, incidentally, were a prayer book, priest's vestments, and other items needed for the celebration of the divine liturgy. Not surprisingly, the death, which the authorities uh, apparently had trouble concealing, was blamed on Catholic clergy who were allegedly annoyed at her for some failing on her part. Now, turning to the Eucharist, what we Eastern Christians call the divine liturgy, the following examples give a sense of what such a service could look like. A father, Teodor Hrushkevich, arrested in 1946, several months after the pseudo-synod, and if you need a reference for that, you can look at your uh, little reference sheet. So in 1946, Father Hrushkevich writes to his wife from the gulag about how he was using piled up bundles of clothing as a substitute for an altar. A father Vasil Kurelas used his bunk bed as an altar. Is that a relative of yours, Larissa? Grandfather. grandfather. So Larissa's grandfather used his bunk bed as an altar in the gulag to serve the divine liturgy. A father, Bogdan Havrich, used his own chest. During particularly vehement periods of persecution, a priest had to celebrate in the dark with a bedsheet covering him completely. An analogous story was personally recounted to me in 1990 by the above-mentioned Archbishop Sternyuk. On Sundays in the early 1950s, during pauses in the work schedule, he would take, and by the way, they didn't get off for Sundays 
in fact, they made sure that you worked even harder, that your schedule was even harder if you were in one of these penal camps, in a real camp, that you worked even harder on Sundays and feast days like Easter or Christmas or whatever. But during pauses in the work schedule, he would take a crumb of bread and the fermented raisin juice that canonically passed for wine into a field where he would lie down pretending to nap. There he would offer the divine liturgy while whispering the text. The guard tower was close enough that the guards would have been able to spot anything resembling ritual activity, and so a sleeping position was required. As for chalices and patens, in some cases, a priest's eyeglasses served as both, one lens being the chalice, the other the paten, or discos, as we call it in the Byzantine rite. Here you see a broken spoon used as a chalice and paten at the same time in the gulag. There's also the story of the wife of an Uzbek prison mate of a certain father, Volodymyr Telenko, who baked a small metal cup, a saucer, and a spoon into a loaf of bread and sent it to her husband in the camp to pass on to Father Telenko. I mean, when I read that, I thought, you know, we always hear about, you know, the knife or the, uh, uh, you know, the tools that, you know, are usually baked into a cake so that prisoners can escape. Well, here you have Eucharistic utensils being baked into uh, bread so that priests can celebrate the divine liturgy. Incidentally, it's noteworthy that even in such dire circumstances, priests attempted to maintain a Eucharistic fast. Instructions regarding a mitigation of the fast, which still required, even in the mitigated form, still required four hours without food or drink, were included in a seminal instruction written by later Patriarch Cardinal Yosef Slipe in 1940 during the first Soviet occupation of Western Ukraine. In other words, they saw it coming. So even before the Nazis had come, and even before the Soviets had returned, the Church of Ukraine, knowing the, what had gone on in eastern Ukraine with the genocide famine and the destruction of the Orthodox Church there during the 1920s and 30s, it knew, they knew that they had to prepare for underground services. The following are two photos of Slipe taken during an arrest that transpired precisely as he was celebrating a Eucharist in his barrack and a, a photo of the barrack from the outside. So there he is. Uh, those of you who know anything about Byzantine liturgical vesture realize that that, that piece of cloth he's got thrown over his shoulders is uh, his omophorion, you know, what in, in the West ended up being the, the, the pallium. There's a picture from the front. Here, and I've never seen that, I'd never seen this uh, picture before. The, the arrow points to the room that would have been his room in the, uh, the barrack, in, in the gulag. Now, turning to a later period and significantly different circumstances. Oh, and before I forget, so I mentioned that frequently enough uh, in the very nasty days, you know, kind of. Um, the 50s, etc. cetera, uh, raids could take place during divine services, as in the case of Slipe's divine liturgy. But any time um, the NKVD and later the, the, the KGB um, in, embarked on a raid, uh, they were very uh, conscientious about making sure that they photographed all the evidence. So what you see here is the quote-unquote evidence that they collected from an underground clerics or, or nuns, you know, um, shelves or, or, or desk or whatever, and they laid out. And frequently, there are all sorts of pictures like this that are now accessible because 
uh, many of the KGB archives are, are open, and you can go there and see, you know, the 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 Arzats, you know, chalice that, you know, the, they were them, you know, um, um, showing as as evidence of criminal behavior, uh, prayer books, uh, other things like that. So as I began to say, turning to a later period and, uh, and to significantly different circumstances, we note that in more remote villages of Western Ukraine, during the uh, less dangerous periods, some Greek Catholics would actually gather for semi-public Sunday services. They would actually gather in the way that uh, I I'm about to explain. So when deprived of an underground priest, they might uh, congregate in front of a closed church that the Soviets had turned, for example, into a warehouse or a similar structure. There they would set up a table. On the table were placed a cross, candles, a tablecloth, along with wine, water, and communion bread. And at the center of the table was an AM receiver. The device would be tuned to Vatican Radio, which on Sunday morning broadcasted the divine liturgy sung by seminarians at St. Josephat's College in Rome, the Ukrainian Catholic College. After the consecration heard over the radio, the people would come forward to receive these gifts. Obviously, stri strictly speaking, uh, these gifts could not be considered the, the sacrament, and yet the reverence with which these people approached these gifts far surpassed that observed at many regular masses throughout the world. The people would then spend hours praying on their knees regardless of whether it was summer or winter. One should also note that sometimes when a priest could be found, villagers would ask him to celebrate a divine liturgy either in front of a closed church or even uh, inside it if the door could somehow be opened. And by the way, one of the things I just learned in the last couple of days uh, was that unfortunately what the Soviets started doing in the late 70s and early 80s is taking note of such churches, you know, closed churches where priests were gathering with congregations to have the divine liturgy, and then use that as a priest pretext to actually tear down the church. So the people all of a sudden realize, oh no, we've got to go back to you know, having the priest come to our home or to, to some entirely secluded area. Finally, note that a certain segment of Greek Catholic clergy were able to continue celebrating the Eucharist by serving in the Latin Rite. Some faithful will also attend Latin Rite churches like the Roman Catholic <coughs> Cathedral in downtown Lviv. Now, while their own Eastern Catholic Church had been declared e illegal in 1946, the Roman Catholic Church was not. Now, of course, the Soviets severely discriminated against the latter and restricted its activities, but in places like Kazakhstan, where significant numbers of Roman Catholic Poles and Balts had been exiled during and after World War II, and also Ukrainians, one could find communities acting more openly. And here you see one such Greco-Catholic uh, priest fully vested in Latin vestments after a public mass in Karaganda. As regards ordinations, certainly one of the most dramatic examples of the sacrament being celebrated clandestinely is that of Cardinal Slipe ordaining to the episcopate his successor, Father Vasil Velichkovsky. And here's a uh, rare photo of um, future Archbishop Velichkovsky when he had been exiled to a, a penal colony. That's his mother to um, his right. A sister, I don't know whether she's a sister servant or a Brazilian sister or a member of one of the other religious orders. And then a, uh, oh, and, and then uh, his own sister his own uh, biological sister. The, um, the ordination to the episcopate by Slipe of Velichkovsky took place in 1963 in a Moscow hotel room right before Slipe's release from the USSR and on his way to Rome. I actually once heard that it actually took place in the corridor, an 
a corridor of the hotel, but I don't know. Slipe had to serve as the sole consecrator, but the almost unheard of right to do so, in other words, ordination of another bishop by only one bishop, uh, was a right that had been granted to Slipe by Pius XII, precisely because of the awareness of these, uh, the extreme circumstances that were about to confront uh, the Greek Catholic Church. In the case of ordinations to the priesthood, uh, these were also particularly risky. An underground bishop could receive an additional 25-year sentence if caught performing an ordination. In the camps, they were extremely rare. However, candidates might be prepared for ordination in the gulag, while you know, in the gulag, and then after their release, ordained in the Western Ukrainian heartland where tracking such activities was occasionally more difficult. Ironically, in 1960, the Soviets established several camps specifically for believers, but they turned out to be a blessing as well because younger inmates would connect with experienced and educated priest inmates who would provide theological training in uh, rather inconspicuous ways, for example, while taking a walk around the barracks. Now, returning to the question of tracking the movements of bishops, one notes that as late as May 1986, so this is right on the cusp of perestroika, glasnost, etc., Metropolitan Volodymyr Sternyuk, or Archbishop Metropolitan Volodymyr Sternyuk, and three deacons were arrested in Lviv during a divine liturgy in the home of an underground priest at which the deacons were supposed to be ordained to the priesthood. Now, in the Byzantine tradition, the presbyteral ordination takes place after the great entrance with the gifts, that is, about two-thirds of the way into the divine liturgy. All of a sudden, during the actual great entrance, the police and KGB broke into the building and arrested all the clergy. They were taken in for questioning, which lasted until 2 a.m. They were finally released, but during the next several days, the authorities continued to bring them in for questioning. The harassment only stopped several months later, when Gorbachev's perestroika actually took effect. Now, turning to funerals, I'm going to have to skip what I had to say about the uh, liturgy of the hours. Oh, and by the way, this is uh, related to the whole question of underground seminaries. Uh, I counted, or Father Hovada lists at least eight underground seminaries during different parts of the, the Soviet period. Uh, and the priest to the right, who at that time, I'm not sure he was a priest, he was being trained by the, the, the priest on, on the left. I can't believe I forget, forgot his name. What's the um, name of the priest who ran the underground seminary in Dora that Patriarch Svetoslav had contacts with? Uh, Olenko, you were there, we visited them. What, what was? Uh, Koselo, that's it. And by the way, I have to tell you, I, uh, his, his sister, uh, was still alive when we visited her. Just one of the most beautiful people. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm going to tear up because you know, I'm going to mention later, well, I mentioned earlier how, how also how uh, these encounters will remain with me for the rest of my life. But anyway, his father Koselo's sister, I think is probably still alive today. And so she uh, was involved in this seminary activity which the individual on the right took over after the elderly priest who had received training during the pre-war period had already died. <clears throat> now, as I said, turning to funerals, obviously even a purely secular burial will have a public dimension. Funerals inevitably draw a crowd and thus can take on aspects of a demonstration. In villages, Soviet authorities might be more lenient and not punish a priest arriving at the cemetery at the last minute to seal the grave, as the rite is called, in other words, the sealing of the grave. But certainly anything more public than that was very dangerous. Thus, the actual funeral service usually took place in the middle of the night in the home of the deceased with a restricted number of believers present. Note, however, that we also have reports of abandoned or closed churches being used for funeral rites. 
And a sense of how dangerous such a public right was is the fact that one such, at, at one such funeral, nine priests were actually present without, of course, anything to indicate their status as clergy. But not one of them was able to risk performing as much as a single prayer, saying or reciting a single prayer or performing a single rite. The person reporting this case noted how the only person who sprinkled the body with holy water was a laywoman from the village. That's how frightened the, the clergy were. Incidentally, as regards vestments, during clandestine domestic services, most of the time a simple stole was worn over a suit jacket, though a filonion chasuble might be added. And in the case of the rite uh, of the sealing of a grave at the cemetery, even the, so the stole, the epitrachir, was dispensed with as is visible in this slide. So I had to look for a while to figure out who, who, the, who the priest is, and it's, it's the man um, to the right there where you can see the, the full, um, uh, you know, the, 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 all of his body. <clears throat> Let us now turn to the last section of my lecture, Lessons for Today. I divide these into three categories, general insights of a more universal nature, two lessons for Ukrainian Greco-Catholics in the West, and one lesson for the Moscow Patriarchate of the Russian Orthodox Church. At the beginning of my talk, I referred to the suspicions of Nietzsche, Mark, and, uh, Marx, and Freud regarding religion and its rights. At the risk of superficially engaging such prolific authors, and I only have two more pages to go, so, so bear with me. But at the risk of superficially engaging such prolific authors, allow me to say that the experience of the underground Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church provides counter-arguments to all three of these hermeneutes of suspicion. A person engaging in a religious rite who will gain absolutely nothing in terms of earthly power, money, or certainly sex, in fact, just the opposite, helps to prove how authentic Christian worship can be far more than a show of status, Pacha Nietzsche, far more than a source of stole fees or income, Pacha Marx, and certainly far more than an expression of sublimated sexuality, Pacha Freud. Thus, we Christians preparing to participate in a liturgical service can call to mind the Father Shovchishin's or the Sister Maria's that we heard about and submit ourselves to a deep and rigorous examination of intention. Their example should help purify one's subconscious from the desire for prominence, profit, or the equivalent of a kind of liturgical stroll down a catwalk. Incidentally, Freud was, of course, right about how religion and its, uh, and its practices can sometimes be neurotic or lead to neuroses. But this is the other reason why I will never forget my encounters with the clergy and faithful of the underground church. So many of them were among the most sane, balanced, and otherwise psychologically healthy people I have ever met especially considering the traumas that they had endured. Another general lesson for today concerns the centrality of appetite in liturgical spirituality. Jamie K. Smith has written a lot about that. In the midst of their hunger, inmates of the gulag would fast in order to prepare to receive a crumb of Eucharistic bread and a drop of consecrated fermented raisin juice. I would submit that the Eucharistic revival spoken of so often today stands little chance of achieving its goal unless Christians return to the tradition of receiving the Eucharist in a state of hunger. Of course, the inane casuistry of the pre-Vatican II period led the church to downplay what should have been the most reasonable way of expressing existential longing for that which alone truly satisfies. 
But that misinterpretation of fasting should never have been allowed to eliminate actual physical pining for the body and blood of Christ. We are psychosomatic wholes, not platonic souls imprisoned by extrinsic bodies. Along those lines, another, uh, another lesson for all of us is that the kind of radically austere and pared down worship practiced by underground believers need not lead to a pietistically disincarnate attitude towards liturgical rites once clergy and faithful receive the opportunity to celebrate according to the semiotics of the heavenly Jerusalem. The same Ukrainian Greek Catholics who as late as the 1980s sometimes whispered texts, eschewing vestments, icons, incense, and certainly the liturgical choreography that makes uh, authentic Byzantine liturgy, such a stunning icon of the cosmos transfigured, those same underground priests began practicing precisely such an opulent, authentically Byzantine worship the moment that the opportunity arose. I'm exaggerating here. Most of them did, and certainly eventually that became the norm, certainly by the early 2000s. So the divine eros of their spiritual pining led to a desire to offer God the best in singing, movement, vesture, architecture, and imagery. And while a desire to stroke institutional egos may be the motivation for a certain number of post-Soviet Eastern Catholics today, the fact is that it was the formerly underground clergy and faithful who wholeheartedly blessed his desire for a liturgy befitting God's majesty and awesome glory once the persecution was over. So looking at the example of the underground clergy should not inspire us to think that somehow the, uh, the private mass or other similar <laughs> forms of liturgical practice and devotion are somehow more devout and to be imitated. For Ukrainian Greco-Catholics in the West, one of the lessons from the underground, and this is now, as I say, for, for us, Ukrainian Greek Catholics, one of the lessons from the underground is that the true glory of their church lies in the willingness of her martyrs to ground their identity in sacramental encounters with the living God. These are far more enduring than ethnocentric or similar exercises geared towards fostering collective egoism. Thus, our temptation as Ukrainian Greek Catholics to turn the witness of the new martyrs and confessors of the Soviet period into a kind of vanity project must be resisted. And the reason that I'm stating this in what may seem to be uh, overly acerbic tones is because after more than two decades from when Pope John Paul II beatified Ukraine's new martyrs and confessors in 2001, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church still has not composed and published the individual propers for all of these new blesseds. We have some of them, but the majority still have not been composed or at least certainly not published. The memory of these new martyrs and confessors must become an effectual memorial, anamnesis, deriving from prayerful dialogue with them in the liturgy hours. It is that kind of memorializing that transforms lives. As for the Russian Orthodox Church, and a suggestion on my part for a lesson for today, the Moscow Patriarchate may want to look to the liturgical spirituality of the underground uniate clergy and uniate faithful to relearn what orthodox worship actually consists of. And I use orthodox here with a small o. Okay? The liturgical deportment of the Moscow Patriarchate, especially during the Putin era, has at times been simply sacrilegious. And I say that with the utmost commitment to real ecumenism and with the utmost commitment to overcoming any kind of nationalism that is tainted with anti-Christian sentiments. 
But I have to tell you that I have become almost physically sick at times during the last nine months looking at what Patriarch Kirill has been doing and saying during divine services broadcast from the Kremlin. And so in that case, the suspicions of Nietzsche, Marx, and probably even Freud are only confirmed by that kind of activity and attitudes. The Moscow Patriarchate could, and I really hope it will, begin to recall its own suffering under Stalin in the 1930s. But what is one to do at the present time when the Kremlin has actually partially rehabilitated Stalin and shut down organizations like Memorial, which were telling the story of Stalin's persecution of the Orthodox Church before World War II? When the Soviets liquidated the Greek Catholic Church after World War II, their minions in the Moscow Patriarchate insisted that the Uniates must be taught to orthodoxize their worship, to embark on opravoslavlenia. But there can be no right glorification, pravoslavia, without the kind of logiki latria, integrated, comprehensive, and rational worship mentioned at the beginning of my lecture. Fortunately, other Orthodox churches and individuals have condemned the kinds of perversions of Eastern Orthodoxy manifested by Patriarch Kirill. And one can only hope and sincerely pray for the conversion of those blinded by the trappings of this worldly power. And this brings us back to where we began in my last two paragraphs. Back to where we began. Significantly, every Eucharist of the Byzantine tradition, whether Catholic or Orthodox, contains the following evocation of effectual memorializing. In other words, anamnesis. The text in the anaphora reads, Remembering this saving command, that is Christ's mandate to take and eat, receive and drink, and all that was done for us on our behalf, that is the cross, the tomb, the resurrection on the third day, the ascension into heaven and the second and glorious coming, memorializing effectually all of this we offer to you, Lord, yours of your own in behalf of all and for all. Now you heard that phrase, we offer to you yours of your own, when I referenced the example of Archbishop Sternuk serving what I experienced as the first divine liturgy that I had ever seen. But he knew that without the antecedent anamnesis, the words that come before we offer to you, yours of your own. Without that effectual remembering, that deep, integrated, persistent and comprehensive memorializing of Christ's saving activity, no offering, however heroic, will fully ever transform the world. And in fact, those of you who know the Byzantine and Afro realize that we also memorialize, we also remember an event yet to occur, that is Christ's final victory. So without probably ever having heard of Paul Ricoeur, Archbishop Sternuk understood the force of the French phenomenologist adage that we become the stories we tell, we become the narratives that we repeat. The cross, the tomb, the resurrection, glorious and second coming. And he also without ever having heard of Charles Taylor, understood the importance of what Taylor has conceptualized as the social imaginary. Consequently, Sternuk and the tens of thousands of underground Christians in the former USSR continued to risk their lives and their comfort to enflesh 
the story of Christ's victory over death and itself, and therefore the victory over the fear of death. These witnesses were regularly, or they allowed themselves to be regularly subsumed into an imaginary crafted by none other than the Savior himself, who has promised to be in our midst not only until the end of the Soviet world, but to the end of every trial that the world can hurl at us. Thank you very much for your attention. And without me uh, in engaging in Anne Carissi, I invite um, uh, Archbishop uh, Gudziak to take it away. Just talk as long as, as, as you want and, and kind of go wherever you want. It's, it, it is a real honor to, uh, to have in our midst someone who is such a specialist, not only on this, but on anything related to the Ukrainian church and, quite frankly, most issues, most problems in the world in general. So please, Vladeko. Sorry. Fathers, I think fathers, so. sisters, friends, friends, dearest Father Peter. We have been treated to a feast by Father Peter, and I have uh, been a beneficiary of such nourishment for more than four decades. And so it was worth coming just to listen. These days, these days, and months give us an opportunity to get a little bit closer to the context that F Father Peter so eloquently described. There's many ways to look at what was happening in Soviet times. One basic fundamental phenomenon occurring then and now is division and death. God's desire for humanity, for Adam and Eve, for you and me, is that we live with God, that we live forever. Separation from God and our death is <clears throat> the antithesis to what God desires. And wherever the evil one is active, wherever the enemy of mankind shows his face, we see division and death. The liturgical life of the church in the underground, the sacraments, the prayer, the communion, was a humble, simple, powerless overcoming of division and death. Those who study totalitarianism social psychologists who try to get close to transgenerational trauma created by violent regimes realize that fear of the other, a lack of trust, is the fruit of these systems. It is a conscious fruit. It is something that was pursued explicitly, systematically. The human being was supposed to be isolated, 
thereby becoming more subject to manipulation. Without communion with God, we become very lonely. We separate. And the power of these powerless was indeed the liturgy, was indeed the prayer, the coming together. It was the liturgia, the the work of the people together, but foremostly, it was work, the work of God in their lives. Something that the liturgy was a conscious, conscious opening to. For me, this Tuesday was another 9-11. We've been at the escalated stage of this war for, for nine months. And I think all of us see it and live it in different ways. And there are different days and different events that hit each of us in differently. After these nine months, just thinking about those 96 or so cruise missiles being launched at homes, places that warm, that give light, the infrastructure, thinking about the seven million families that on that day were deprived of light, water, uh, heat, just brought me back to the kind of experience that we, or you actually had, because I was in Ukraine on 9-11, here. But in Ukraine, we experienced it as well. I was with Christina Fraser watching. And realizing that the world would never be the same. <clears throat> the object of those missile strikes is to bring fear, separation, and mortification into the experience of the people of Ukraine. The object is to break them. And if you create distance by instilling fear, it is clearly easier, or so it seems, in a calculating way to dominate, possess, manipulate. The underground churches, Father Peter so eloquently showed us, was powerless. It, did, it was deprived of means. It was Christ stripped down. It was dissenting. It was on a trajectory that is, for us, counterintuitive. We want to go up, up, and away, higher, faster, stronger. We have Olympian mottos and growing desires, whether it's the bank account, whether it's grades, whether it's the quality or size of our homes, we measure things by increase. And Jesus goes down. And his church in Ukraine was brought down. It was led down. It was not a masochistic experience of people trying to put themselves down. Somehow in God's unfathomable will, it was happening. And there the paradox becomes mystery. The powerless, those who are stripped down, those who are deprived, those who are incarcerated, <clears throat> 
sent off to prison camps, become some of the most free. The encounter with the underground was a great privilege in the lives of a number of us here. My encounter was in the late 1980s and early 90s, before and after the legalization. Father Simchishin is somebody I visited shortly before his death. I was paging through my pictures because I wanted to show you. Uh, he died, I think, a year and a half ago. Sister Maria was somebody I had a special relationship with, and I have a portrait of her in my house. Um, some of the other people pictured I met and knew or interviewed. They were run of the mill. They are heroes. Today they stand out. They some are venerated at altars, but in real life they were very simple. And yet in their simplicity, they called us to emulate them. I just realized that right now, I'm wearing an embroidered shirt under a cassock because I saw Archbishop Stenuk do that. I wasn't a priest when I saw that, but I said, I like that style. <laughs> I mean, he's with me, you know, when I, when I get dressed. Um, I was in that apartment, which was not just an apartment, it was a room, because he shared the kitchen and the bathroom with the neighboring family which had a mentally handicapped boy who would kind of run in and out of that room. In that room, ordinations occurred. And one paradoxical reality is that there were young men, married men, who from the country of the free and the brave or from the land of the great me me <coughs> liberal maple leaf would go to totalitarian, to the totalitarian Soviet Union to receive the sacrament of, of priesthood uh, because they could not be ordained here because they were married. The whole story is full of paradox. The whole story is a little bit overturned. It's all so unlikely. By the late 1980s, by 87 or so, 86, 87, the number of priests was reduced from 3,000 to 300. And their average age was over the age of life, life expectancy for males. This was a cohort that was going to die. It was going to be cut out of reality. Separation and death, the goal. And yet, this witness of simple people Maria Shveda, by the way, is immortalized in the iconography of Father Marko Rupnik in the Redemptoris Mater Chapel, um, completed in 1999. She is the example of laity. Uh, they're non-canonized, but iconographically maybe without a halo depicted. With your son, before her icon and the icons of others, last Friday we celebrated Vespers. Mm -hmm. 
She had no chance, that girl, being beaten by men with brass knuckles. But she was carried by the Lord, and she's carried into our anamnesis, and she's in our liturgy. She was part of liturgy. She carried herself liturgy. Those few, the weak, who were real people in flesh and blood, they trembled when there were noises in the hallway, when there were knocks on the door. They did their best to close the windows with black shades so that the prayer at night could not be discovered by seeing the light from outside. They were powerless, but the power of God was active in them. Today, the Soviet leaders that Father Peter has listed with dates on the fact sheet are in the dustbin of history. And the discovery of this efficacious, life-giving, prophetic witness of the powerless is only beginning. The prayer allowed, facilitated, fostered the experience of God's presence and of God's relationship with humanity, all of humanity in a grand communion and also in a great personal intimacy. That communion and that intimacy then carried so much. You will not yet read it in the New York Times or in The Economist. But that liturgical life, that community, communion in the community of the powerless is at the heart of what is mesmerizing the world today. The struggle for defending God-given human dignity, the incredible solidarity Having returned to Ukraine, from Ukraine to New York, I was kind of struck by something. What did I not see there? I didn't see anybody lying on the street. I did not see abandoned people on the streets of Lviv or Kyiv, Bucha or Borodyanka or Irpin. Despite the fact that 14 million people were deprived of their homes, they're somewhere. They're with someone. Someone is receiving them. Despite the poverty, Ukraine was probably the second poorest country in Europe before this invasion. It has been deprived of 35% of its GDP, 23% of its agricultural production. 150,000 homes have been destroyed, 1,000 hospitals, 3,000 schools have been damaged or destroyed. And yet, there is a struggle for human dignity, and there is this incredible solidarity. Solidarity which spreads, solidarity which is flourishing in Ukraine, and solidarity which is shared globally. Solidarity in which you have been so generous. The army, which had four or five years ago a military budget that was 1 20th of the Russian, 
military budget, is standing like David against Goliath. Because there's subsidiarity, things are decided at a low level, giving many authority and calling all to responsibility. And there is a general summons commitment to labor for, sacrifice for the common good. All these are the pillars of Catholic social doctrine. Dignity, solidarity, subsidiarity, the common good. At those intimate clandestine liturgies, there could be no dreaming of broad political programs, of strategies, of tactics of liberating the church, much less freeing society, much less becoming the epicenter of global change. But this experience of the liturgy was the seed, the yeast, the salt of the kingdom. It was human. It was marked by sinfulness and frailty. The underground had its divisions and its hatreds, its foibles and its scandals. But it was a place open to and summoning the presence of God. It allowed the Lord to work. It invited God to be present. And God's power made the powerless prophets and carriers of life of communion. I venture, I propose that it is this experience that is one of the most seminal factors in what is happening in Ukraine today. Just think about how things can spread. Slava heroin, Slava Ukraini, heroin Slava. That's something that today nobody in Donbass knows where it comes from. It's not my preferred slogan, but five, 10, 20 years ago, it, it was on the lips of just a few. A few from the same geography. Those who remember the Maidan of 2004, remember that it was predominantly Western Ukrainian. In a real sense, it was pro predominantly Greek Catholic. That predominance maybe became a mere plurality in 2013, 2014. But the legacy of that witness was being carried. The legacy of that witness was a bearer of the received. Those people were formed by the great pastor Metropolitan Andrei Sheptetsky. They were formed without maybe explicitly remembering the paragraphs, the theses, the ideas. Because that's what happens when the good news becomes part of life. You don't have to think about it. You share it by communion.
And so President Zelensky doesn't know yet that that's where his conversion comes from. <laughs> At least this being one of the sources. He doesn't say Kakayaraznitsa anymore. He doesn't doubt, as he did until February 23rd, that the Russians will invade. He has become, from a comedian, a person that speaks prophetically. He's been given a charism. He's been offered a conversion. And it was those who, in the underground, having no power, remained faithful to the call, who lived their baptism, who would carry those liturgical vestments, who would suffer the brass knuckles, who celebrated the liturgies, ordained the priests in rooms that were living rooms and bedrooms and dining rooms, all in one. The liturgy encompassed it all. And the life of dissent became a life of resurrection. I thank you, Father Peter, for this magisterial lecture. I hope it's spread widely. And I think we're only beginning to see how important and fruitful the catacomb prayer, the underground liturgical life of the powerless was and continues to be.